Okay, here we are again. Uh, we talked about the scarlet worm. This is going to be part two of it. Scarlet worm, Tolat Shani. And this is a picture of that old scarlet worm. And it's what we're going to be talking about today. And uh, we're going to tell you a little bit more about it than we told you the last time. In Latin, the crimson worm is known as Cocos elisus, and it's a very special worm. It looks more like a grub than a worm, but it is actually an insect. It's the it's the larva stage of the insects, what it is. Um, in Latin, of course, you know, is a language of everything. They make it the language for everything. But her eggs are called berries, and they they really look like berries. They look like strawberries to me. But I believe this grub is one of the most remarkable insects that's ever been created, if not the most remarkable. Okay, and this is called the Kermes oak tree. Uh, this is a picture of one in Israel, which I've visited many times. But this is a, what they call a scale insect. This is what we're going to talk about. And it fills up with eggs, and then it attaches itself to this oak tree. And I believe in Amer the Americas they attach to a prickly pear, the prickly pear cacti but here in Israel they mostly attach to these oak trees only I'm sure they'll get on the pear, prickly pear there as well but anyway um, she attaches herself to this tree so as to keep herself separate from the wood uh, of the tree the bark of the tree that would kill her uh, eventually will but the word for crimson grub and as I said in Latin is cocos lysis cocos means scarlet and um, some say that delicious means it is finished. Now, I have not been able to prove that. I've hunted around and dug around trying to find out if that was true, but I couldn't find it. So, you know, we're not going to dwell on that because of that. But I did think if there was any truth in it, that it was remarkable because of what this worm stands for. Uh, nonetheless, this insect is in the cotinial insect family, and it's where that we get red food dye from. It's where... Um, uh, that what they call the E120 dye comes from. And I don't know if they still have any of these drinks or not, but a few years ago they had drinks called Sobe Life Water, and the reddish-looking ones and orange ones had this um, insect. And they Well, they didn't have the insect in it, but they used this insect for the dye to make the color in those drinks. They're really pretty good drinks, but some people think that's gross, so I don't know if they made food coloring out of it. It's all about the same. And might even explain actually why I have a friend who's allergic to the red dye. Okay, and now this is a, a tree. You can see the Kermes oak leaves and this insect is attached to it. But um, this worm called the Shawnee, and that, mean, that stands for the word crimson. Anyway, um, it was where they got the dye for the wool in the biblical times and for the priest and different things that they used. And it was highly prized by the wealthy. But this grub will attach itself to this branch, as you can see on here. And it's very small. Even though it may look pretty good size in this picture, it's actually way smaller than this picture. So it takes a lot of these little little worms to, to, to make any dye. And that's why it was so expensive. But if you notice something else, too, about the leaves of this tree, uh, they're serrated or thorny looking. There's like thorns on them, which I find very interesting especially what we're going to talk about. Um, we're going to show you what this crimson grub is actually a type and shadow of. And here you can see someone holding the leaves where that it's... Uh, I'll pull in a little closer where you can see it better. But anyway, they're showing you... The, this is them after they be, they've begun to lose their red color, and you can see the, the thorn thorns on the uh, acacia tree here. But um, they're getting a little bigger, and they're losing their red dye. They only have a certain length of time. Some say it's three days. I really don't know um, that you can get this dye from them. If you don't, it begins to go away. But they only grow from about five to seven millimeters um, during the summertime while they're there. And they have to be harvested before the red eggs hatch. And because when they do, they're going to leave the mother. And they're going to take that red pigment with them when they go. So it has to be done before they leave the mother. All right, I'm going to show you something. Now, I know this may not sound or seem to, to pertain to what we're talking about, but it really does because I'm going to give you some scriptures. I gave you some last week, um, Psalms 26, 22 and 6, where we read that uh, on the last lesson that it was prophetic of the Messiah being on the tree. 
as it goes on to speak about his hands being nailed and his feet being pierced and his hands being pierced. But I want to show you something. This is the modern Hebrew letter Tav. This is the ancient Hebrew letter Tav that was used during the time of Ezekiel. And this is the phrase, I am a worm, that is used in, in Psalms talking about the Messiah. It's Ani Tola'at. And this last letter is not, this is the modern Tav. This is what you'd see in the modern language. But it's odd to show that the ancient Hebrew letter looked like a cross. I am a worm. And the cross is the last letter. To me, that's very significant because we know that this is speaking of Messiah in Psalms 22 and 6 where he's crucified and it happens later on. Um, but the letter Tav has been added into this Tola, because Tola is a worm. The letter Tav has been added Tola'at. I am a Tola'at. In ancient pictographic Hebrew, this letter looked very similar to a cross. So this psalm is literally, and in a hidden sense as well, shows a sacrificial worm connected to a cross or a tree. Some histories even say that sometimes the Romans used trees to crucify their victims, which we know was true. So uh, it could have been a cross beam that he carried instead of a cross, and in the sense that we think of it in a, anyway. Uh, many believe that in calling the Son of Man a Tola'at, in reference to the Tola'at Shani, or the Crimson Grub, that it speaks about his crucifixion. And it's strange to me that this very phrase would actually, in ancient times, end it in something that looked like a cross. Okay. And this is Ezekiel 9 and 4. It says, And the Lord said to him, Go through the midst of the city, city through the midst of Jerusalem, set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh, and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. This fourth verse of this chapter tells us that the Lord sent the man in linen, which was an angel, um, could have even been uh, Jesus, Yeshua, to place a tov on the forehead of those who had cried out to him all, about all the abominations that they saw in the city um, and in the temple courts as well. And you might say, well, where do you see that letter tov? See, it says set a mark on the foreheads. The letter tov and the word tov are virtually synonymous. Uh, we saw what the letter Tav looked like and what it meant. It means sign, mark, covenant, and it looks like a cross. So the Lord is telling his angel to go out and put the Tav in the forehead. What's he telling them? What was the Tav? What did we see it look like? In ancient times, in Ezekiel's time, it looked like a cross. He was This angel was going forth and setting a mark on these people that looked like a cross. And this was a separation of godly people from ungodly people, with the godly people having a mark placed on the forehead to distinguish uh, the Lord's mark from the unbeliever's mark. And there's so much in this that I'm not going to get into right now, but the cross, the tree is so significant that, and in the fact that it pertains, the crimson grub is a type and a shadow of Messiah who was, who was literally hung on the cross. And these people, when they're crying out in the book of Ezekiel, this angel actually goes and puts a mark, a tov, the word tov on their forehead, uh, which was, a, I believe, a cross because that's what a tov was. And it was done for a sign to show that they were godly because there was supposed to be something that was going to happen that the ungodly and the unbelievers were going to be under judgment. And this this mark upon them showed they were not. Well, it's the cross. It's the blood of Jesus today that, that distinguishes the godly from the ungodly. And when you accept Christ in your heart, you've got that mark. You've got that cross on your forehead. You've got that seal on your forehead that's going to protect you in, in a time of judgment. Uh, if we're here in, in any time that God judges, then that mark uh, in our heart and, and uh, on us, because of the cross, because of what Christ did, protects us. Okay, now look at the leaves. See how this thing is attached? It has attached itself so much that it has become literally almost a part of these leaves right here. See it with my fingers. You can see, really see how the thorny the, the leaves look, looks like. Notice how this tree is such spiky, thorny looking leaves, and she's attached to it almost to become one with the tree. Was our Lord not crowned with a crown of thorns, and is he hung on that tree, pierced in such a way to almost become one with that tree? She can't be removed from this tree without without leaving some of her red gel on the tree, without leaving part of her on the tree. She has become one and and, and 
part of this tree. Well, Messiah, when he went up on that, he became part of that tree. They nailed his hands. They nailed his feet to that tree. He became one with that tree. There's such a significance in the crimson grub and how that is a type and shadow of the Messiah that it just literally, every time I study this, every time I teach this, it just literally blows my mind. I'm serious. Okay. Now, this shows their attachment to the bark right here. You can see it. This shows the, the one with wings. This is the male. He doesn't stay on the tree. The female stays on the tree as a worm. She eventually grows into, uh, into an insect, but she will die on that tree. She will die on that tree. But this shows you the, the, the male, though, he flies away. He flies away. He's able to fly up. He's able to go up. Okay. Look at the appearance of these. They look almost like candy. I think it's so strange. I always, as I shared last week, I think it reminds me of that Christmas candy that they use or the old gumdrop things they use with the sugar on them. I know it sounds weird, but that's what it reminds me of because we had a lot of that when we were kids. But there's many red grubs attached to this tree. They lose their legs during their first instar or their first molt. And this is when they're first born on the tree. And after this instar or this molt, they mate, they move around, they develop, and then they later attach themselves uh, to this tree and then they permanently fill up with eggs and they draw sap hatch inside the mother's shell they consume their mother then they burst through the shell to escape and this fluid runs down this tree and it stains the wood of the tree it stains the, the, the little babies on there um, and I have heard but I still haven't verified it for sure that this takes place around a period of three days but I do not know but it says the worm can be scraped from the tree and the gel used to make a dye, but they have to be picked before the eggs hatch or else the, the dye will be lost, the fluid will be lost. Uh, they can be picked, dry, picked, dried, and then stored for later use to, to, to use the dye. Uh, the worm knows when it comes on that tree that it's not going to come back down alive. She climbs up that tree, fastens her body to it, uh, or in the case of some, is born on it and uh, attaches herself to it. Uh, knowing it's going to be the last thing that they do in life and it's going to this tree this these insects um uh, is going up here to birth a family in other words when that female goes and attach herself attaches herself to that tree she knows she's going to birth a family there and um she knows she's going to die but she, and but she's going to to have a family and you know when i i heard this i was like oh my gosh christ knew that when he went up on that tree that he was going to die but he went there to bring forth a family, the family of God, the kingdom of God. He made that ultimate sacrifice, just like this little crimson grub does, uh, so that her children may live. He, he, he died on that cross so that his children might live, so that those that he chose could live. Um, and I'm going to read you some scripture. Matthew 20 and 28 says, Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. In other words, he came to die. He came to give his life that we might live. 